Good morning. Now I'm all get on the right page here. Welcome in Jesus' name, all of you who are here in person and all of you online. We gather together to worship Jesus Christ, and we pray and just thank you all for being here. Please join me in singing hymn number 126. <laughs>
This morning's psalm is in Psalm 106, it's on page 829. And the first phrase that we're going to read is our verses 1 through 6. or show forth all God's praise. Blessed are they who observe justice, who do justice at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you deliver them, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glorify in your heritage. shipped a molten image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore the Lord intended to destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach to turn away God's wrath from destroying them. Save us, O Lord our God, and gathering us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. favorite verses. So guess and we'll talk about it after the service. Philippians 4. My dear friends, I love you so much. I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy. Fill me with such pride. Don't waver. Stay on track, steady in God. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Make it clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up at any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when God displaces worry at the center of your life. Summing it all up, friends, I'll say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you have learned from me, when what you heard and saw and realized. Do that, and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Hear what the Lord is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. 
As we prepare for the reading of the gospel, please stand for this morning's acclamation. Gospel according to Matthew. <clears throat> I heard the voice of God there for a second. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fattened, ca my fattened calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. And the king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their cities. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets, invite everyone you find banquet. my prayer and I said God that wasn't that wasn't a nice thing to do so that's how I start the the process I look for those things where I struggle with the most and then I go into the kitchen now those who cook know what I'm talking about because you have to get all your ingredients you have to put things where I had a friend who was a mechanic a wonderful mechanic and one day I was visiting back in Ohio and I had something wrong with my truck, and I asked him, would he, would he look at that? He looked at it. He sat there and he looked at it. And I th thought maybe he fell asleep. And he just looked at it. 
Then he walked and got a tool. Well, first thing, he got this kind of a rug and laid it on the... It took him two hours, two hours of preparation, and it took him 10 minutes to fix it. Now, Anna's always saying to me occasionally, I worked in the kitchen all day long, and it took us 20 minutes to do this dinner. Doesn't seem fair, does it? But that's part of the process. And so I'm in the kitchen, and I'm talking to God, and I'm looking. I'll look at other looking at everything and I'm still not feeling comfortable with that passage be attentive to what you're wearing be attempt attentive to what you're wearing. Now, you may think I'm talking about the outer garment, but I'm not. And I don't think that the wedding garment is what's really the problem here. I think there's something else going on here. So be attentive to what you're wearing is not about clothes, but how we wear our inner self outwardly. The scripture also says that what comes out of a person's mouth is reveals their heart. And what comes out of our mouth more often than not reveals something more about us than what we're talking about. Because we're wearing those inner garments. So Michelangelo one day was pushing a slab of marble over to his studio and some of the people that were there said, what are you doing? What do you hope? And Michelangelo stopped and looked at him and said, somewhere within this slab of marble, there is an angel ready to emerge. And then there was another sculptor who uh, had a vision of a turtle for whatever reason, I can't tell you. But by his vision, by his eye, he was able to make these turtles all the same. He made hundreds of them. And people ask him, how is it that you can do that? And his answer was this, I have a vision of the turtle and I just eliminate all the excess. Baptism is a way which God sees our true self. What happens in baptism? We die with Christ. What, what are we dying to? We're dying to the excess that covers the true self that you are, created in the very image of God. So the message that I'm addressing today is about old clothes and new clothes we are to wear as disciples of Christ. The old clothes are following our, are kind of like our four emotional states. There are many, many ways I could go with this, but I'm going to focus on these four emotional states that humans, all humans, go through. We're going through that right now with the war in Israel. We've been going through that with Ukraine and Russia. We went through that with the pandemic. There are different ways in which we respond some of us respond rationally and logically. Many of us respond emotionally. We all respond emotionally. We don't know if we are or not. So that's part of the excess. We bury ourselves sometimes in our logic, in our rationale, and forget the emotional part of our being. Now, these emotional states that I'm going to reveal are not wrong in and of themselves because they are the occasion for healing and transformation of our excess baggage. We carry excess baggage. And because we carry this baggage, that's the stuff that obscures the vision that we have of God or the vision that God may have of us because we can't get beyond that, ex, that baggage that we're carrying. And so what that baggage does is this. 
it obscures our awareness, ourselves and those around us. It obscures our understanding and it obscures our perspective to limit it to our perceptions rather than understanding that our perceptions of reality may not be reality at all. So what are these four things, four emotional states? First is fear, anxiety, and apprehension. When we are in fear and anxiety and apprehension, we are left with a feeling of hopelessness and the feeling of helplessness. I have a lot of fear and anxiety and apprehension about this war in Israel because I feel hopeless and I feel helpless to do anything about what's going on. And when we're in that state, we often will project out and blame. Now remember very carefully, this is really key to understanding that, that the baggage that we carry are kind of like our wounds, kind of like the pain that we carry. And if we're, not, if we're not willing to allow that to be transformed or healed, then we begin to transmit the pain and suffering and transmit the anxiety and the fear and the hatred toward others. So we want to blame. We want to do, we won't take any responsibility. We, and so that's what fear and, and anxiety does. That's the first layer. The second they're all, they're all interconnected, but the second one is anger that leads to hostility and hatred. Anger is uh, something that's turned in on ourselves. We become so angry, we become angry at ourselves that we project that out, and when we project that out, that's hostility. And generally, we become angry because we feel limitations. We react to our limitations. And yet, maybe those limitations are a way in which we could discover who God is for us. So, it leads to negative emotions and negative energy because we feel powerless. When people feel powerless, it does lead to negative emotions and negative language. Then there's this feeling of depression, guilt, and psychic pain that people experience. It leads us, therefore, to act out our trauma to traumatize other people. When we are traumatized and we're not dealing with that in a healthy manner, then we, we project that and we traumatize others because we've been traumatized ourselves and we tend to connect with those who are wounded in a way that just creates this negative energy and emotions. And then the fourth is this destructive egoism. That means that you are right in your own eyes, that it destroys our marriages, it destroys our relationships, it builds walls of us and them. That's what's occurring in the world, us and them. We are the good guys, they are the bad guys. We wear the white hats, they wear the dark hats. We're the ones that have the true religion, they don't. And all of that leads to this destroying of relationships. And when we wear our baggage, when we feel these things and don't quite understand what that's all about, we're more often than not not even aware of it because we just feel like we're so bright. So it might mean that we need a new set of clothes to wear from inside out, not from outside in. Right? Then you might ask, well, how? How do I get these new clothes? I'm glad you asked. So we're going to go shopping for some new clothes. All right? You with me? And we're not going to do any window shopping. Because window shopping is you look at it and say, well, that's pretty nice, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to wear that. Or that's pretty good, I should, but I'm not going to do that. 
And I think in one sense, this person that was in the wedding banquet, how did you get in here without your wedding garment? Is a person that's just from the inside out harming other people. All right? So there has to be rules. There's one thing I, I came to, in, to appreciate in this, in this gospel, because in the, in the gospel lesson, you have the king. It's a parable. Keep in mind a parable. But you have the king who has a, what he would, would call the, the inside crowd. And he's inviting only those people to the banquet, the insiders, and they don't want to come. And so finally he says, well, forget them. Let's just open the doors and invite anybody and everybody. They can all come. But what you soon discover in this passage is that even though everyone is, is invited to come, there are still what I call house rules that you have to follow. This is with Paul, so I'm going to share with you Paul's house rules. He says in Galatians chapter 3, which is actually a re reference to baptism, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, in other words, we die with Christ, we get rid of the old luggage, we get rid of the excess, we get rid of the old baggage, and then we are raised up in our baptism, we are raised up with Christ, who seated at the right hand, says, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also be revealed with him in glory. This is a reference to our baptism. Now he goes on to say, these are the house rules. Number one, you got to take off your old clothes and put them aside. What are the old clothes? He's very specific. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside your old clothes, your old self with its evil practices. You've laid that aside. Then he goes on to say, now put on your new clothes, which is the new self who is being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of one who created him, the image of God in you, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, male, female, gay, straight, and you can go on and on and on because you are all one in Christ. Now, because you're one in Christ, you've got to put on these clothes and live according to the house rules. This is not a free-for-all for everyone to come in and say, I can do whatever I want. Feels good, do it. It's not about that. It's about not harming other people people with the words that we speak or with our attitudes and I think in the parable and of course I can't tell you that that's what's really happening parables are written to flush out to tease our imagination to think differently than the way we think and so as I was reading this parable I kept thinking about this man that got kicked out and I thought that's just not right God would never do that but in one sense, if the person is harming other people, being destructive, anger, malice, lying, at some point that has to be called out. And then he goes on to say, now, put on your new clothes. And here are the new clothes that we're called to put on. A heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you should also forgive others. Beyond these things, Paul says, put this cloak, put this on, and that is put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to one body, 
be thankful that the word of Christ richly dwell in you with all wisdom and teaching, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and giving thanks to him. So how do we put on these? How do we put on these new clothes? Sounds great. I'm window shopping right now. I, yeah, I like kindness, love, unity, uh, and I don't like anger, malice, and all that. Uh, yeah, you know, Lord, when I can afford to buy it, I'll come back. Well, these clothes are for free. It's called grace. But how do we begin? Where do we start? Well, Luke 24, 49, let me just read some of that passage. I'll let the scripture answer the question. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law, of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened his mind to understand the scripture. Now this is my personal belief. You can not believe if you don't want to. I don't think you can honestly understand the scriptures unless the Lord opens your mind. Well, I study scripture every day, at least two hours. And before I dig deep, I pray, Lord, open my mind and my heart that I might receive what you want me to receive. He said, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from dead on the third day and that the repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, he tells his disciples. And behold, here it is, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. Here's the promise, not only to them, but to you and me. And he says... You are to stay in the city, which means stay in prayer, seek the Lord, continually open your mind to the Lord until, until you are clothed with power from on high. So these are the clothes that I'm talking about are the power of God from on high that clothes us because it takes the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to dress us. And you know what? Sometimes I forget to wear my new clothes and sometimes I pick up an old garment and I get angry, get frustrated, and I go through all of those emotional states, anger, hostility, guilt, shame, all of it. It's all there. Then I, then I realize, you know what? I don't need these clothes anymore. I'm taking them off. And then Paul says, oh, and by the way, when that happens, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Galilee, and the outer reaches of the world. Those, that's what the witness is. It's about your new clothes. It's not about your words you say. You know, as St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. When all else fails, use words. But that's your last resort. Then in Ephesians 6, Paul again says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might Put on the full armor of God. Because God knows, Jesus knows, that when we are sent out as witnesses, a lot of things are going to be said. Slander, lies. All of that's going to happen because you're walking in the light and dispelling the darkness. And he goes on to say, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the powers, against the forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of weakness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist the evil one on that evil day and have done everything to stand firm. 
Uh, I used to do, I haven't done this quite a while, but when I was reading this passage, I thought maybe I should practice. Every morning, he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. I would just put that on, right? And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Wherever I go, wherever I walk, I want to walk in peace. I want to bring peace to people, not condemnation, not judgment. In addition, taking up the shield of faith, which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I like, I forget the movie star's name, he's a Christian, I can't think of his name right now, but he, he said once that if you have no struggles in your life and nothing's coming at you, you're not doing something right. When you start doing what God wants you to do, you're going to get all kind of trouble. And that's a sign that you're doing something right. So don't be afraid of conflict. Don't be afraid of what people say. Because you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's the principalities and powers of the air. And the only one that can de defeat the principalities and the power of the air is the Most High God. The Most High God who sends the power of the Spirit upon our lives. And then it goes on to say, you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of Christ, which is the word of God, all of that you start to wear. So what does all that mean in relationship to the parable? Be attentive means to be mindful, pay close attention to your attitudes, be alert, be awake, be watchful. It also means to be of comfort to others. To be of comfort to others. To be consciously aware of how your words and behavior harm others. To be attentive improves relationships. Actively listening reduces the number of problems to solve. 80% of all problems, I don't care what it is, is a lack of communication and a lack of communication because we're not listening. We're not listening to God. Be attentive does not create a moral equivalence to deflect, doesn't give advice unless asked for by reflecting what a person says without interrogating them or accusing them in a judgmental way. I hear this all the time. Someone says something and someone wants to square them away and they're shooting from the hip I call them drive-by shooters being attentive to what you are wearing is not about the clothes you wear but how we wear our inner self outwardly it's obvious to me that in the story this person was wearing his inner self outwardly in harmful ways. That's how he knew he wasn't wearing the wedding garment. Christ offers us, all of us, a new set of clothes that reflect a new vision for the world, a new reality of relationships based on the vision of God has for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who should ever love God so what Christ has done what God has done through Christ is simply is very simply as this has given us the gift of new relationships based on the love commandment a new relationship with God a new relationship with ourselves as significant others and with otherness and difference so if you really want to know if you're wearing the clothes the new clothes that God provides us take a look at your relationships Are you complaining, bickering, grumbling against God like they did after they were delivered from Egypt, from Egypt into the promised land? They crossed the sea, saw all these miracles happening, parting of the sea, God's providing. You get on the other side, and you know what they complain about? The food. The food. 
we would have been better off staying in Egypt. At least we got three square meals back there. And we had clothes and we had shelter. What do we got out here in the wilderness? I don't know if Moses said this, but it would be a right answer. Well, you got God to begin with. And you're in this liminal space and we're going to the promised land. Let's trust God. That would be good, don't you think? So let us repent, ask for forgiveness, and live our baptism, a new way of living that reflects the vision of God for us. Through Christ, in the Spirit, we are delivered from our old baggage, and it sets us free to put on our new clothes of healing and transformation. May God add a blessing to his word. Amen. We praise your abiding guidance, O God, for you sent us Jesus, our teacher and Messiah, to model for us the way of love for the whole universe. We offer these prayers of love on behalf of ourselves and our neighbors, on behalf of your creation and our fellow creatures. We pray for those who are estranged from their spouse or family, friends or neighbors, who find it difficult to forgive past wrongs done to them. Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who for years have carried feelings of guilt or regret for something they did or something they neglected to do, who find it difficult to ask for forgiveness or to forgive themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those watching someone they love try to cope with serious illness or injury, and who long for your miraculous intervention. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the many others in our world who are suffering this day, from grief or loneliness, hunger, poverty, illness, or the effects of violence, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. our uh, vital connection today, I want to just share with you that starting today, Deborah has put this together. If you have a prayer request, uh, you're invited to come uh, probably around the baptism altar area, and someone will be there available to pray with you for any need that you have. It could be for a rededication of your life to Christ. It could be for a friend or a family member that's going through some awful time, or you might just want to pray specifically for the things that are occurring in the world, but someone will be here to pray with you. So please take advantage of coming 
at the end of the service and pray. And I'll mention it one more time a little bit later. Our coffee fellowship is immediately after the service today in the social hall. Uh, I'll have an afterglow that will meet in the library. Bring your coffee snacks and we'll discuss the message today or whatever is on your heart. You can see everything else that's going on this week in your bulletin. Later this month, there will be a Social Norms Halloween open mic and concert will be on Saturday the 28th at 6.30 in the social hall. Our trunk or treat even will be on Sunday, October the 29th from 2 to 4 o'clock in the parking lot. And I just want to mention this to remind you that the last week in October, I'm going to be flying with my granddaughter back to Kentucky where she is going to give her paper that she wrote uh, in a lecture toward, uh, toward a conference of a bunch of philosophers. In fact, when she was invited, they thought she was a professor and she said, no, that's my grandfather. And they wrote back, we still want you to come, but bring your grandfather with you. So I'm going to go with her and she'll give that paper on, the, on that Saturday. So keep a prayer for her and, and for me and uh, then we'll return later uh, Sunday night or Monday morning. So I'm really excited about spending some time with my granddaughter. Now, uh, let's, um, we're going to share a video now of, the, uh, of our bishop sharing with us about uh, at the charge conference that our, the meeting that Deborah and Abby and I went to last Monday and met with him and other churches and they showed this little video and asked us to show this uh, video to you as well. Here we go. If it works. And it may not work. It's working. So our theme for this year is go and do likewise. Built on the parable of the Samaritan. Many of you read that text or heard it many times throughout our annual conference sessions. And we told you then that the theme was not just for sessions, but it would guide us throughout the year. We also shared with you that we would use the framework of the MILE, the M-I-L-E, to guide our work. The M of the M-I-L-E is for ministry that matters, and it's in three parts, housing, health, and measuring. First, housing. This is not all about building new housing, but it's also addressing issues around policy related to housing. We will have a housing summit or symposium this fall that will help us understand in great detail how we might address issues of housing and houselessness in our areas. The second part of the M for ministry that matters is health. And here we're talking about physical health, mental health, public health. This is really a general area here where we're really looking at how we live our lives and what are those ministries that we're engaged in or those that we need to engage in to bring about better health in all of our communities. The third factor in the M is measuring. We will assemble a team of community organizers and academics to help us understand how to share our impact statements and also how we measure what matters as it relates to housing and health. So all that we do, we'll keep track of it so we'll know where we started and the direction we're moving in as we do our ministry that matters. The I for the M-I-L-E is for itineration and location. Doesn't sound all that exciting, oh, but it will be. Because this is our opportunity to look at how we are deploying and assigning pastoral leaders across our area. This will also involve looking at how we fund or how we compensate pastoral leaders and teams. We'll also include in this some ways to incentivize and encourage congregations and ministries to collaborate in ways that they have not considered doing so before. The L in the M-I-L-E is Lay Ministry Enhancement. And this is our opportunity to elevate the ministry of the laity in every single ministry setting. I believe that God has called every person to serve. I believe that it is our responsibility to ensure that every person has what they need in order to live out that calling. 
Now, this is not about being called to licensed or ordained ministry. This is simply about opening one's heart and mind to what God has called you to be and to do in this world. The challenge here is for every ministry setting to select at least one person that you will pray for collectively by name as they discern what God is calling them to do in this season. Again, this is not about licensed or ordained ministry. It may lead to that, but that is not the purpose. We want every person to wake up every day aware of who God has called them to be and be able to live that out. We're working with our conference and district lay leaders to ensure that there are trainings and other opportunities for each of you to join together to study and explore options and ways in which you can be at work in the world in the name of God. The E in the M-I-L-E is elimination or eradication of racism. I would love to live in a world where racism was not a real thing for all of us, but we don't. And I don't think our ministry carries much integrity when our own church exhibits and perpetuates racism. Yet we go out in the world and say that the world needs to eliminate racism. I think we're called to a higher standard and that's for us to deal with our own internal racism as we go out into the world. So we're already well on our way of creating some learning cohorts, and we're also putting together a resource that you'll be able to access on our website. And regardless of where you are on the journey toward eliminating racism in your own self, in your own family, church, or community, we have resources there where you can enter the work or enter the conversation. This is not an opportunity for us to say who's ahead or who's behind, but this is an opportunity for all of us to get on board and point in the same direction toward a world where racism and white privilege do not rule the day and every decision that's made. It is a challenge for us, but it is work worth doing. This is important. This supports all of our M-I-L-E efforts. So. E is not the least important, it's just at the end, again, so we can spell out mile and do the work that God is calling us to do. I belong to a, uh, uh, it's called National Jubilee. It's based in South Carolina. There's a bishop there that has a ministry of um, he the healing of race relations through hospitality. And uh, I go and speak there at least once a year. Uh, and generally, I'm the only white person there, uh, but it's been a wonderful experience. But I've had them come to the various churches that I have served since the early 90s. And I remember on one occasion when the group came to share and to preach, he's a wonderful preacher, uh, that some of the African-American friends were walking around in the sanctuary looking at and and I started talking to them and he said, you know, this is the first time I've ever been to the white man church. The same group, we were meeting in a black church in Long Beach, California, and the pastor and I were getting to know each other and we're sitting there as the people came in from my church and the people from his church all the black people sat on one side and all the white people sat on the other side. And then we looked at each other and we said, mix it up, mix it up. And all the black people on this side and all the white people on that side. Sometimes, you know, um, the most segregated time of the, uh, of the, of the week is 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So I would love to invite them to come at some point and listen to what they have to say and see what, how we can uh, heal the race relations and all other aspects of human relationships through hospitality and kindness. Uh, we are going to toll the bells at this point and I'm in a lot of pain. I'm sure some of you are in a lot of pain about what's happening in Israel. So I'd like for us to pray for uh, both the Palestinians that are innocent, 
or as much as victim as the Jewish people are. Let's ring the bell. Please stand in spirit and body and let us recite the Lord's Prayer found in your bulletin. Let us pray the words of Jesus taught us. Eternal Spirit, Earth is maker, pain is bearer, life is giver, source of all enemies that shall be, Father of our mother of all, loving God in whom we serve, the hallowing of your name. The way of your justice is followed by the people of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your common love of peace and freedom is sustained by the in the common earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the words of the world, we are all one another. Forgive us. In time, our temptation is shut down. From trial to grave to the Lord. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For your reign and the glory and the power of that love, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Because there is grace that God provides for each of us to be forgiven and to be a reconciled people, let us now offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Mighty and righteous God, as we bring our tithes and offerings to your altar, we confess that we see ourselves in the stiff-necked stiff Israelites in the wilderness. We are quick to lose sight of you, especially when our focuses turn in the direction of gold. Your anger and disappointment are so justified, and as Moses intervened for the Israelites, Jesus has ab advocated for us with his very life. Help us to keep our focus on you, like the pathway you would have us walk, we pray with this gratitude for your love in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward and receive the offering this morning. together and if you have prayer requests there will be someone to pray with you here this morning and also uh, if you want to come to the afterglow that would be wonderful now receive the blessings may almighty god bless you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit go in peace to love and serve the lord Praise Praise god. God. amen